I got it. Okay, I want to welcome all of you to Polar Week. Um, we're very excited to be hosting several live events this week that are in celebration of the polar regions and the uh, spring equinox, or uh, maybe I guess it's fall equinox if you're down in the southern part of the world. Um, anyway, we are we have two presenters here, uh, Jennifer and Pierter, and they're going to talk about um, being scientists in the polar regions. And they have our great presentation coming up. Um, a little bit about Polar Week and what we have going on. Polar Week started on earlier on the 18th of uh, uh, earlier this week on the 18th of March, and there's celebrations going on all week. You can um, check it out. Um, what is happening in your area through the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists website, APEX. They are the ones that decided to host this Polar Week in honor of the polar regions. Um, there's like I said, there's lots of activities going on. They have a virtual balloon launch on their website. So today, after you're done with this presentation, you can check out their website and, and launch your own balloon as for participating in Polar Week activities. Um, with that, um, we're going to go into the next slide, which talks about the uh, platform that we're using today. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And for those of you that have been here, um, just joined us, you should see the slides should be changing in the center of your screen. There's a list of participants on the left. Um, and there's also a chat feature where you can chat your uh, type in your questions to uh, either one person or the entire group. And this is a great spot that as you have questions um, during the presentations, you can um, chat them in this area or type them in this area. Um, if you have questions as we go along too, you can click on the little hand icon that's above um, the list of participants, and that raises your hand and lets us know you have a question. Um, this event is being archived, and we'll post the archive link and how to access it on our website, as well as share it with APEX for the Polar Week activities. So um, with that, we're going to go into, oh, that's OK. We want to uh, do participant introductions and find out where you are from. So if you haven't had a chance to use your mic or talk, um, when you talk with us, you need to click on the Talk button and click it once to open the mic and click it again to shut the mic. Please tell us your name, where you're from, and how many students. So we'll just go down the list of participants and um, we'll start with uh, Gary. Good afternoon. I am Gary Wishy. I actually come from and live in Kansas City, Missouri, but I am traveling in Norway and am coming from Trondheim, Norway where I am work, uh, visiting with some uh, early career scientists that study birds in the Arctic and along the coast of uh, Norway. Great, welcome. And I see some of you are chatting. Uh, make sure that it's to the whole room and not to just Sarah or myself, OK? If you want everybody to see it, you need to make sure that goes to everybody. Um, welcome. Um, we'll get to Jennifer in a moment. So let's go to uh, Marshfield High School again. So go ahead, uh, John. Introduce yourself, your school, and who do you have with you today? Hi, Janet. Hi, Sarah. This is John Sody from Marshfield High School. We're just getting ready to start class. We're going to have about 18 students and one or two teachers joining us. And we'll have about another 32 students watching this on the archive later today. Excellent. And where where are you located at? We are located in southwest Missouri near Springfield, Missouri, close to the Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri border. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Okay, and uh, the next group we have, and she's been introducing uh, herself on chat, but you're welcome to talk again, is Sandra. Hello. Can you hear me? You follow. Yes. You are, you are hearing us? 
because we don't hear very well. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So we are here with a class of students from Portugal. They are all very excited, but they wanted to see you, <laughs> and we cannot know. Isn't it? All right, welcome. Thank you, Sandra, and uh, the students from Portugal. Yeah, it's kind of hard to hear sometimes. Everybody's connection's a little bit different. So I just want to remind uh, both our speakers and others that will be talking and asking questions later. We do have people from all over the world joining us today, and so be sure to talk slowly and clearly so that everybody can understand what is going on. Um, and there is no video today. Today we'll just show pictures, but we do have pictures of the presenters coming up. They sent us their pictures, so you'll get to see them in a moment. And actually with that, I think we're going to go to um, uh, go to the first slide and um, we're going to get started with the presentation, Connecting to the Poles with Jennifer Proventure and Piotr Angel, and then I will uh, Talk about uh, where they're from, and in just a moment, I think is Jennifer presenting. So Jennifer, we have your slide about uh, the Arctic, and um, I think it's the the first two slides introducing the Arctic and the Antarctic. Up. Great. Hi everyone. My name is Jennifer, and I'm very excited to be speaking with you all today. I am a student, and I am working in the Arctic on birds. And I am very excited to be joining you here today, from calling in from the Canadian Arctic. So just to look at what we're going to be talking about today is we're really interested in looking at the poles. Now, some people are familiar with where the polar regions are. Um, and we, at the top in the north, we have the Arctic. And we can see it's above North America and Russia and Europe. And at the very bottom, we have the Antarctic. And so these are the two areas that um, polar researchers are really interested in. And we'll go to the next slide. OK. We're there, Jennifer. And so if we look at this slide, we can see that the Arctic is actually mostly ocean surrounded by land. And there are eight countries that border on the Arctic. We have the United States, Canada, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. And we can see that all of these countries have coastlines on the Arctic. In the wintertime, this area is almost all frozen. And in the summertime, there is some ice, but there is also lots of open water. And then the next slide is the Antarctic. And you can see here that the Antarctic is very different from the Arctic. The Antarctic land, and it's surrounded by ocean. There are no countries that officially um, have land in the Antarctic. And back in the 1960s, it was written, it was protected by the Antarctic Treaty. And the Antarctic Treaty was signed by many, many nations. And it basically says that all nations are welcome on the Antarctic soil or Antarctic waters for scientific reasons. And so many, many countries have bases there, even though there are no official countries located in Antarctica. And it is covered in ice most of the year. So even in the summertime, when the researchers like Peter go to the Antarctic, it is still covered in snow and ice, except at the very edges where some rock is exposed. And we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of my work. So my name is Jennifer, and I'm a PhD student at Carleton University in Ottawa. And I only went to the Arctic recently. In 2007, I was able to travel to the Canadian Arctic as part of the international polar year that was happening during that time. 
And I'm interested in marine birds. So if you look at the map, I actually grew up near Toronto, Ontario in Canada. So I grew up in a big city where penguins and polar bears were very, very far away. But there's lots of shopping malls and stores and museums and other things around. So I was always interested in animals, but had never really thought about the polar regions. But I'm very interested now as I grow up. So if we go to the next slide. So one of my favorite things when I was a kid to do is I love to swim. And so I've always been fascinated by marine biology. I love everything that goes in the ocean basically. And now, if you go to the next slide, I get to study swimming ducks. So in the north, we have a group of ducks that we're very interested in. And they, one of the coolest things about them is they swim to the bottom and they eat lots of food. And we're really interested in knowing how healthy these ducks are and tracking them over time. And so we'll go to the next slide. So these are the two areas where I work in the north. And I work mostly with communities and hunters. And so right now I am working and located and speaking to you from um, a community named Santa Kilowack. It's an Inuit community and it's located where the red star is on the map. And so we're in Hudson's Bay in North America. And it is all ice around here right now. And so all of Hudson's Bay and all of the Canadian Arctic is all frozen shut with sea ice. And so where you see blue on the map is actually ice right now. And so we go out with local hunters on skidoos that you can see in the picture. And that's actually us sitting on top of the ocean or riding on top of the frozen ocean. And we go out and we look for ducks flying by. And so just like we eat chicken in the, in the south, many, many people um, eat chicken. In the north, there are no chickens here, but there are ducks. And so we eat lots of ducks. So we go out and we look for ducks flying around um, as they um, live in, on the ocean. And we work with hunters to collect them. And then you can see sometimes we have to wait for a long time for the ice, on the ice for the ducks to come. And we get to sit and chat. And you can see in the lower right, sorry, low, yeah, lower right hand corner, we build a mini or half an igloo that we sit behind so that we can hide. And then we wait on the sea ice for the ducks to come. And then once the ducks come, we can we work with the hunters and we take samples to measure the health. It's like being a doctor and you go to the doctor and they take a look in your throat and a look in your ears. We do the same thing with birds. And so we check the birds out for the house, and then the hunters actually take the birds home, and that's how they feed their families. So the next time you have chicken for dinner, you can imagine in the same way these hunters bring the duck home for their families to eat. And we can go to the next slide. So we study both boy ducks and girl ducks. And you can see the boy ducks are black and white. They're very handsome. And the girl ducks are the brown ones. And they're brown because they have nests that they want to hide from other predators like polar bears and, and birds like gulls. If, if they were very, if, when the, the gulls and the bears find the nest, they like to eat the eggs just like we eat the eggs. And this species of ducks are called common eiders, E-I-D-E-R-S, eiders. And so if, you've, if some people who live in cold locations have duck down jackets, or they have jackets with lots of feathers in them, a lot of those feathers actually come from eider ducks. And so we're interested to see how healthy these duck populations are, both because the hunters and, the, and families in the north rely on them for food, and also because they're an important industry for, um, for um, collecting the down to make those warm jackets. And we'll go to the next slide. <laughs> 
<laughs> so one of the things that we do is we work with hunters, but we also want to study the eiders as they are nesting. And so we catch the eiders in nets, and then we give them bands and nasal tags to track the individuals. And so we call this duck jewelry. And so this particular duck, you can see on her leg, she has an, or on her nose, she has one white circle on one side and one red circle on the other side. And that's her combination. And so we catch her in the spring and we put that combination on. And then where she nests on the island, we know exactly who she is and we can get lots of information like how many eggs she has and how many babies she has. And then at the end of the season, that actually her nose rings or her nose tags actually fall off. We actually use the same equipment that they give stitches. If anyone's ever had stitches and they get dissolvable stitches, we use the same material and so they just dissolve over time and fall off. Now her anklets that we put on her, those are unique just to her. And we put those on and you can see that she's got red on one leg and then silver and actually blue on the other leg. And those are specific numbers again to her. And those are really important because it means that when she comes back the next year and she doesn't have any nose tags, we still know who she is. And so we can track those people over time. And so one of the changes that we're seeing is that as um, historically, as people um, in some areas were hunting lots and lots and lots of ducks, we started to see those population of ducks go down. So there were less ducks to hunt. But now through our work and through our monitoring, we see that the duck populations are stabilized, which means that they're a good, healthy population. And so we work with the Inuit people and the people of the north to make sure that um, the right number of ducks are being hunted each year. Another change that we're also seeing, which is one of the projects I work on right here um, in Santa Kilowack, is how um, hydro dams um, in Ontario and Quebec are actually changing. They release the fresh water. And so there's all kinds of different things that can affect these ducks, from climate change to hunting to hydro dams releasing fresh water in the winter time instead of the springtime when it normally happens. And so we can go to the next slide. So the best part of my job is that I get to go to lots of new places and be outside a lot. And so you can see in, we catch the ducks mostly at sunset or sunrise. And so we work some late or early morning hours. And you can see that it's quite beautiful. The sunsets in the Arctic and in the Antarctic last a long, long time. I also get to travel a lot by snow machine or snowmobile on the tundra, which is really fun. Sometimes on the flat sea ice, you can go very, very fast. We live mostly in tents, and you can see our white tents in the bottom. We sleep in these tents and we cook in these tents. And we get to meet lots of fun people through our work. And so because we work with communities mostly and we collaborate with many different researchers, we get to meet lots of people who all care about the eider duck for different reasons. And the next slide. And at the end of the day, our job is really to make sure that the ducks are nice and healthy. We want all of our individual ducks to be healthy, but we also want the populations to be healthy. And in this way, we can make sure that communities in the north can continue to hunt ducks and feed their families and supply nice, warm outfits um, for themselves and for other people who live in cold areas. And I think that is my last slide. All right. Thank you very much. Really. Really cool birds those are. <laughs> really pretty. All right. Well, if you had, um, I, you you answered Gary questions as we were coming along, uh, as we were going along there. So if anybody else has questions, uh, John Sodi's group. We lost a school for just a moment. They were switching classes. They'll be coming back in about ten minutes or so. So um, don't don't worry about them. They'll be back soon with a new group of students. 
Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box, and we'll have time at the end to also ask both presenters questions live. So, um, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, now we're going to turn over to uh, Piotr. So go ahead and um, and just uh, your slides up, and we'll let you talk about your presentation. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for for the invitation. I'm also very excited to share my Polar experience with you. Uh, I am originally from Poland, and right now I'm doing my PhD in at University of Western Ontario in Canada. I am a geologist and geographer. I finished two master degrees um, in back in Poland, and uh, my research uh, is focusing on Mar Martin. Antarctica and also polar regions in, in the north, Iceland. And uh, maybe I will start uh, from from the very beginning. So, how how get I excited with with polar regions? So first of all, my my both parents they are geographers, and because of that, I was exposed to science for from the very beginning, and we got a lot of few trips together with my parents. We went to forests, uh, mountains, and I was just fascinated with nature. And later on, my father went uh, went to Svalbard, which is a, a big archipelago, Norwegian archipelago. In it's, it's Norwegian and it's north in in Arctic. It's 78 degrees north, and he studied there. Uh, permafrost, frozen ground, and I was just, I was just so excited with his pictures of polar bears and plants he collected there that I said, oh wow, it would be so great in some moments to to go to such a place and and work, and I was I was very lucky to to go to to Iceland in 2001 when when I when I started my my first degree in geography, and I was studying glaciers there. And and what I noticed there were huge changes. We we knew where the, this glacier, this is Vatna Yoko glacier. We know we know where this glacier was 100 years ago, and we could see where it's now. And the change is is very very big. You can see just on the level of my head there is a small rocky island on on this glacier, and on this. On such an island, you can see how thick was glacier before, and 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 how thick it's right now. So before 100 years ago, this whole rocky island was covered with ice. Now it's 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 visible, and we can see that this this change was about 100 meters. So in 100 years, this glacier lost 100 meters in thickness. That's a very very big big difference. So after these studies, I, I I went to to Antarctica and I got a job offer as a researcher to go to King George Island. You can see it on on the end of this of this red line on the on the on the map. And I was working there as geographer and I spent 15 months straight on on this island. This is. This is very, very, very strange location because when you think in about Antarctica, you think about this huge ice mass and very, very cold temperatures. But King George Island is is on the tip of Antarctic Peninsula, and the climate there is is very different than than in Antarctica, in the con on the continent. So the climate is more more mild. There is there are some months when average temperature is above zero Celsius degrees, but still this island is 95 percent covered with ice, and that was just great adventure. First of all, because we went from Poland on the on the ship to Antarctica, so it was 35 days on on a boat just cruising there, and then 15 months studying glaciers and uh, and plant communities and and penguins. So I think we, we, we jumped one one slide ahead. Oh thank you. So there you go. first of all because I was there for so long time I was able to see glass changes in glaciers uh, uh, extent 
on my you know before before my own eyes. So here you can see how how big is this change just just over one year. And this is because if the climate is getting warmer and it's not enough snow on the on the top of this of this ice field to to cover this uh, ice loss on the on the edge. And this is just one year, and you can see that the edge retreated about. 20 meters over over this this small period. <coughs> also, these changes are visible in in longer scale. We know we know where this this glacier. This is another glacier, White Eagle Glacier, where this glacier was in in 19 in in the beginning of 20th century, and we can see how much this glacier retreated. It's about four kilometers, and I was uh, doing maps in the in the field and I was mapping plant communities in this in this area and you can see some examples of these plants on the top. So on the left corner it's Caloplaca regalis. This is a uh, lichen. Lichens are very common plants in, in, in Antarctica and there are, then there are two higher plants. The only two higher plants they are growing in Antarctica. In the middle picture it's the shams is Colobanthus. Uh, that, that, that's one one example. And then on the right hand side, there is a grass, the shams Antarctica. And these plants are really fast in in colonization. So you can see that in place where glacier was one two years ago, these these plants are already there. So it's not that glacier is is retreating very fast. Also, plant communities are changing very very fast. So this was my first first uh, trip to Antarctica, and then I was lucky to get another job offer there, and I went to study penguins populations. And I spent half a year living in a small hut in far away from from Polar Station. I, I forgot to mention that I was working on Polish Antarctic Station on King George Island, and I was hired by Polish Academy of Science. And this is our our site in. Lion's Ramp, and three species of penguins are living there: Gentoo penguins, Adelie penguins, and Chinstra penguins. And we are studying population changes of, of those penguins. So every every year we are coming there, and we are counting nests, we are counting chicks, and we are looking how these populations are changing, and and how this is related to climate changes, which I am interested in. So these penguins are eating Antarctic krill. You can see. This shrimp-like animal on the top top left corner, and krill po krill population is very sensitive to sea ice extent change, and because climate is warming in the in the region, there is less ice, so there is less krill in the in this area, and and actually we can see that penguins populations are are following this trend, and for example, Adelie penguins have very Strong, very strong uh, decrease about the, the population dropped about 17, 70 percent on over 30 years. So this is this is this is great opportunity to, to see to see these changes by studying penguins, not going to the sea. And why why this is why this is important and why why this. Uh, why, I'm, why I'm doing this. So first of all, by doing this, uh, I'm recording the present status of uh, of the of the of the Antarctica, of the of the glaciers, of plants or penguins. And by doing this, I can see how this how this changed over over 30 years, 50 years. But also, I can try to predict the future. I can I can see what's What's the trend, and I can think what would be the future. What what the future will bring? How how these changes will change uh, penguin populations, for example. And as I as I as I showed you, these changes are are very fast, and plants and animals' response and glaciers' response to climate warming is very fast in this in this area. So this is very important, and I am very thankful for this opportunity because I can. I can share and communicate these these changes to others as you and and we can we can think about how we can stop these changes. 
So if you have any questions, I'm I'm very happy to to answer. Here's also email if you like to email me. And thank you very much for the invitation. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, we uh, do have some time for questions. If you want to ask your question live or or uh, just type it in. So there's two different ways. So you can type in the question in the chat room, or you can click on the little hand icon above the list of participants, um, and um, that lets us know that uh, you want to talk um, to the presenters and ask your question live. Um, in the meantime, while people are uh, getting squared away and thinking about questions that they want to ask you, we have a question for both of you. So um, you're talking about being what what it's like to be a scientist um, and a little bit about how you got into science. Um, so what is it about science that you really like? Why did you choose this path? And we'll start with Jennifer. Sure. I started um, when I was in high school. Actually, one of the things that I really liked about science and biology is all the different cool things that happened out there. And so, um, like I said, when I was a kid, I used to love to swim, and I was so intrigued by everything under the ocean. And one of the coolest things that I learned about was that. Um, in the ocean, there are still things that we there's still new species that we haven't described yet, and each year there are new areas of the ocean and that we've never really studied before. Um, even just 40 and 50 years ago, we used to think that everything on the planet needed oxygen to survive. So we breathe oxygen, ducks breathe oxygen, bears breathe oxygen, plants produce oxygen. And just in the last 30 and 40 years, we have found two new types of ecosystems under the ocean, very, very deep down, that don't use oxygen at all. And so that was amazing to me that you know we could know so much about the surface of the planet, and we could send people to the moon, and yet we are still discovering things under the water. And that was really, really amazing to me. All right. Uh, Pierre, Pierre. All right. So as I as I as I told you before, my my father was on Svalbard, and I saw him with polar bears and on glaciers. And the first, it, I was six eight years old at that time. And then when I started my 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 first uh, grad school at geography department in Warsaw, I said, Oh my God, I would love to go to study glaciers to try to understand how how they are working. So actually, th this trip to Iceland that was that was just my idea. I I said to my friends, I would love to study glaciers. Let's would you like to go with me? So I organized a group, and uh, yeah, and we we found a sponsor who provided a jeep car. So we drove to Denmark, and then on ferry we went to Iceland, and that was great adventure and also the first chance to see glaciers and then it just it just carried on and then I then I was more and more excited and then I went to spend two years in, in Antarctica. And what's what's great about being scientist is to I think to is to find answers. You you always wonder how how does it work? And and actually you can See how how does it work and how how does it change? So that's a that's a fantastic opportunity to see it in before your eyes. Okay, and um, there's a question for you that just came up through chat, and it says, "Were you in Antarctica uh, near where Shackleton and his crew were stranded?" All right. So yes, I, I was I was quite close to the place where where the crew was landed on Elephant Island. The Elephant Island was the was the place where where the where they when they get free from from ice when they started on their boat they went the first stop of their trip was on on Elephant on the Elephant Island, which is which is exactly right here where where this when this finger is point, pointing. And Elephant Island is in the group of South Shetland Islands, 
and Kinvert Island is just 100 kilometers away from 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 this island. So I was I was very close to this to this island, and actually I went to Elephant Island with one one of the of the Antarctic crew ships, and yes, yeah, so so I, I saw I saw this place, and it was very amazing place because this group spent I think two months on on a very narrow beach, just eating seals and penguins, waiting for for Shackleton to to get rescued him to to, re to rescue them from from this island. Yeah, great question. Um, okay, um, I'll ask another question here for uh, the students. So, what is it like to really work in the polar regions? Do you have to, you know, what do you eat? How do you dress? What do you work out of? Do you get really cold? So, we'll start with. Uh, how about um, uh, Jennifer? Go ahead. Sure. Well, in the Arctic, it depends on whether we're here in the winter time or the summer time. So I work here in the winter time, and we, as you can see from the pictures, it's it's mostly ice. All of the ocean is covered with ice, and we and we travel on snow machines. Uh, today, the temperature outside is about negative 20 um, uh, degrees Celsius. Um, someone will have to convert that for to Fahrenheit for me. Um, it's it's pretty cold, so it, we it's we have um, many layers on. I work with Inuit communities, and so we actually um, the Inuit and Northern peoples have been living in the North for a long time, and so they wear um, often wear seal skin pants and and skin jackets, and we all wear down filled coats. To stay warm, and so when we're here working with them, we often wear the same things because they have um, they have a long history with dealing with the cold, and so we we do what they do and bundle up, and so we wear many layers. But one of the tricks to working in negative 20, and sometimes it goes down to negative 50 degrees Celsius. Um, we is you have to move slowly, and so you can stay warm with lots of layers and and lots of skins and down on, but you don't want to break a sweat. If you break a sweat, you kind of get damp, and then you get really chilled. And probably most of us know that even from being in the south. And so we we tr we tend to move slowly and move um, very carefully, not to not to get too sweaty inside our many layers. And then, as long as you can stay warm and dry, then you're then you're great. You are um, nice and toasty. Um, and for us, we we travel for for days on snow machines. And so, one of the things that we also do is have lots of um, cushy layers so that we don't get bumped around too much in the back. Of the, we ride in comatics, which are little um, sleds that they pull behind the snow machines. And so we we tend to have lots of layers and and hunker down for long long trips. All right, um, Peter. All right. So so in in my case also it was different. In I work in the winter time and in the, in summer time. <coughs> and in in winter time, as you can see on this picture, it's it's exactly like like Jennifer said. It, many many layers. Uh, and moving slow because if you get sweat, you are you are losing heat very very fast. So so it's very very dangerous. And and also special equipment to work on gla glaciers, special shoes, ropes, and safety first. So if if there is there is stormy weather, if there is n there is no no good visibility or the wind chill is is too high. We rather stay at our base or camp. We are not risking our lives. And it's different in, in, in the summertime because in summertime temperature for about three months on King George Island is above the freezing. So it's getting very muddy, marshy. <laughs> and and actually Wellingtons, these kind of boots are very important because everywhere is very very, very 
wet, so you can lose your shoes very easily. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the difference. But all the time, it's it's all over the year. It's very windy because you can see that King George Island. It's just on the south of Drake Passage, and Drake Passage and Cape Horn. You probably you probably hear heard about this 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 region. is it's super windy, super stormy, the most dangerous place to to sail. So our island is just just south of Drake Passage, and it's very very windy. So wind is it's a it's a big problem there, and stormy weather could be could be really dangerous. Thank you for the question. All right. So uh, related, um, you just talked about your that uh, having wind chill be your dangerous situation. Jennifer, do you want to add to that? Because Marshfield's asking about the most dangerous types of situations you might find yourself in. Yeah, we have um, working in the in the winter. Our most dangerous situations are definitely when we travel on the ice. Um, and we always we always work with locals, and we always work with hunters who know the ice very well. But you can see from the bottom picture that we're sitting on the ice, but the edge of the ice is not very far away. And so we are very careful that when we walk, we walk in the footsteps of of the hunters, and we follow them very carefully um, because if if we are Hours away from town, and uh, a snow machine, or sorry, a snowmobile goes through the ice, or someone goes through the ice. It can be very, very, very dangerous. Um, the other part of our job, more in the summer, is um, we work in areas where there are many polar bears. And unfortunately, polar bears. Well, unfortunately for us, polar bears often like to eat birds. And so we tend to work in areas where polar bears like to come and snack on eggs and birds. And so we are um, very, very careful and have to be aware of bears. And so some days we see bears every single day. Um, and for the most part, we don't have a problem with them. And they're, they're, beautiful. they're beautiful to see. Um, but we do have to be careful and know where they are at all times. All right. Um, okay. So while we have you on, um, we have another question. What problems do you have with equipment in the cold? Um, our most, our biggest problem with equipment is actually having plastic equipment in negative, you know, forty degrees. Uh, it doesn't do very well. In the south, we are very uh, dependent on plastic cups and plastic thermoses and plastic rope. Um, but in, the, in, the, in very extreme temperatures, those things tend to crack and, and break easily. And so one of the things is that um, most of the, of the hunters that we work with do not like uh, man-made, or sorry, um, synthetic ropes, like plastic ropes. They to put on their on their snowmobiles and the comatics, the trailers, because they break in the in the in the uh, in the cold. And so we actually work with hunters that make um, rope from seal skin. And although it's a, you know it's an old technology, it's it's much better technology than the plastic because in the cold it's not a problem; it still works. That's interesting. So uh, Sarah is asking about the uh, bird tags being made of plastic. Yeah. So the bird, so the the duck jewelry that she, we put on their nose, we call them nasal tags. Those are put on with surgical surgical string, and so that when she um, by the end of the season when she molts, that will fall off. Um, and then the the bands are made out of a special plastic, and and then also metal. And so they they seem to do quite well. We have birds that um, were banded not not by me, um, but by my boss and some of my my bosses um, in the late 1970s and in 1980 and 1981. And the birds still have their 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 leg bands, their anklets on. And so. Uh, there must be some combination of the birds 
being in the water, which is warmer than the ice, and then also the birds. Actually, we can see her legs are sticking out there, but they have this amazing ability of sticking their legs right up into their feathers that they, um, they don't seem to have a problem. Uh, yeah, so the really, really cool thing about some of the birds that I study is that um, some of the eiders, um, one group of the eiders, they migrate south. So the eiders that we see in the Arctic are the same eiders that we see um, in Newfoundland and, and Greenland. But there is a subpopulation of eiders that spends all winter in Hudson's Bay. And so that's where we that's why we're here. And so there are open areas of uh, ice called pollinias. And these pollinias are areas that are kept open mostly because of really fast currents around the islands. And so they don't freeze. And so this subpopulation of eiders have actually ad adapted to stay here all winter, even in negative 40. And so although they, um, it gets very, very cold, they can stay on in these open areas of ice. Yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's a big uh, pollinia, I'm sure I know you know, uh, that's off in the Bering Sea near St. Lawrence Island, which is very similar to uh, where Jennifer is working. And they have uh, eiders over there that hang out all year, all winter long. Um, okay, there was a, let's go back up here for a moment. Um, Piotr, do you, do you want to respond to uh, what problems do you have with equipment and any other dangerous situations? Uh, all right. So my my main problem with with equipment was w with batteries, I think. And since I am a professional photographer as well, I, I photographed a lot. And the first problem I I had it was with with batteries. They were they were dying very very fast. I was really surprised how how fast they were they were dying. And the same thing was with GPS and other equipment, which was with with batteries. So. The, the best way was just to keep batteries close to your body <coughs> and and just load them for for pictures and this way they they were fine and how about uh, dangerous situations we were we quite often we moved between points in in Antarctica on small zodiacs these are small boats not not like this canoe but the same length i i, I guess with with uh, with with engine and it's because there is a lot of ice around the around the shore, so it's easy to land on on the small boats to to the land, and that's that's quite dangerous. First, first of all, you can easily flip over with with this boat during the landing, and also when you are on open on the, on open water, the weather is changing very fast. As I, as I told you before, it's quite stormy there. It's it's south of Drake Passage, so. Once or twice, we got very, very dangerous situations when, when we we got trapped in the middle of, of of the of the bay, and our zodiacs were full of waters. Our body temperature went really, really down because we were almost floating in in water. And you must you must know that temperature of this of this water is minus two Celsius degrees. It's because this water is salty, so it's it's freezing in not in zero Celsius. It's freezing in almost minus two Celsius. So, so you can if you if you are naked in this water, you can survive maybe for one two minutes. If you are well covered, it's 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 better. But but still, it was it was very scary when when it was stormy. Thank you. All right, thank you. So there was a question earlier from Julia, and it was for Jennifer, and it was, have you seen a difference in the amount of ice in Hudson Bay? Yes. So one of the things that our group is studying is how changes in sea ice affects eiders. And one of the things that the um, community here in Santa Kilowack have noticed uh, mostly over the last 30 to 40 years um, actually has happened because of large electrical or hydro dams in Quebec. 
And so James Bay, which is a little tiny bay, a little knob that sticks off of Hudson's Bay, just below the star, has a lot of dams. And you can see uh, in Quebec, there's, well, in Canada in general, but in Quebec, there's a lot of fresh water. Um, and they have built dams that keep the fresh water behind the dams. And then what people in Toronto and New York City and Chicago, when they, when they crank up the heat in the middle of the winter, um, then those dams release all that fresh water that's built up there. And so but that's a, that's a challenge for Hudson's Bay because usually all the fresh water would, would enter Hudson's Bay in the springtime and mix and then the, the, the ice forms in the wintertime. But now with the hydro dams, that fresh water is caught in the springtime and kept on the land all summer long. And then when we flip our switches in the cities in the south in the wintertime, all that fresh water is released, which generates electricity, but then it goes out into James Bay and into Hudson's Bay. And they have seen some um, very um, great changes in the sea ice over um, the last 30 to 40 years. And so not only do we have changes in climate, which are warming, but we're also um, seeing changes in the salinity, or how salty the water is in Hudson's Bay. And that has big impacts for the sea ice. And so our, the Inuit hunters that we work with are telling us um, more and more that although the ice is forming in many areas, um, it's not necessarily about more ice or less ice, but it's about greater variability. And as a hunter, it's important to be able to predict what the ice is going to be like so that you can be safe. And when you can't predict the ice type, then that can get quite dangerous. And I'll just mention quickly that one of the researchers that we work with um, who has been working in Santa Kilowack for the last 10 years, has actually made a movie about our work and about the community and what the community has seen happen over the last 30 and 40 years. And so if you, after the webinar, if you go to the website, um, it's called peopleofafeather.com. You can watch the trailer and it, it, you'll sh you see amazing images of eiders and more information on the project. And we also have um, an educational package that goes with it that I'm happy to tell you more about for those who are interested in eiders and learning more about what's happening in Hudson's Bay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so um, we had another class that uh, just joined us. So hopefully you can get a little bit here before we um, wrap up in a moment. Um, uh, Piotr, you didn't get a chance to talk about photography. I don't know if you want to. Both of you have fantastic pictures. So any um, additional thoughts or tips about that that you guys want to share? Sure, sure. I can I can try to share a couple tips with you, and I think that the most important with with photography in, in general, not, not only in polar regions, is to think ahead before taking pictures and thinking what what would you like to to show. It's not about pressing the button. It's just it's more about what would you like to show. What's the subject of of this picture? And then work on frame. Work on Lights and and try to also I, I I love to look at good pictures and think why I I like these pictures and by doing so you can you can easily get this inside inside your heart and then when you when you take your pictures you can you can really really do well so that would be my my tip about about photography thank you. All right. Anything else you want to add, Jennifer, to that? I think my biggest tip is to just keep taking pictures. Some of my most amazing pictures are not necessarily ones I planned very well. Um, that picture that is 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 an eider is 
is um, was taken um, because you see that happen and you get into into place. But you you um, being you know just take keep taking pictures and being in the right place and. Um, the beautiful thing about digital is you can snap away and not worry about it too much. And so, um, when you're starting off, I highly encourage people to just just keep taking pictures and then look at them. And, and like Peter said, what do you want to show, and what do you like, and what don't you like, and then take some more. Just keep taking pictures. <laughs> okay. So let's see. I think we got all the questions that people had um, typed in there. So I don't know if anybody has any other things. You're good too. Yes. All right. Um, so I think that's it from um, our end here. And we want to thank all of you guys for. Um, well, we want to especially thank Jennifer and Pieter for um, presenting today and taking time um, this week to share your polar world with the rest of us and help us to celebrate um, the polar regions. And we hope that for those of you that just participated in this live event, that. Um, this just gives you a, a little sample of what the polar regions are all about, and that you'll take some time to explore them on your own, either in person or virtually or through the internet or whatever way. Um, again, we'll um, post this uh, archive link out there on our Polar Trek website as well as through APEX, so that those of you that couldn't be with us for the whole time can um, check that out or um, share it with others. And um, just to let you know that Apex and uh, Arcus Polar Trek, we do a lot of uh, live events. Um, so there's a lot of great opportunities through both of our organizations to follow scientists and learn more about the polar region. So we hope you'll take advantage of, of those um, of our organizations and those opportunities. And again, thank you very much. And uh, we hope you all have a good day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, and uh, obrigado. Obrigado. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.